three. Hello, I am so happy to be here uh, and giving this presentation. I'm new at this, actually, though not new to astrology. I've been, um, my name is Catherine Zumstein, and um, I have uh, been involved in astrology for about 39 years um, and sort of floating in and out of it. Um, and uh, now approaching my second Saturn return, I'm feeling a very strong impetus to get deeply into my original love and passion. And uh, so uh, today I'm going to be uh, talking about um, basically the autumnal dance of Venus with Uranus, Mars, and Lilith. And so it's including the Venus retrograde motion, but also um, what happens before that, you know, as she enters Scorpio. And I'll talk about the different layers um, as we go along. I am um, a student of Maurice Fernandez and um, actually started studying with him about 10 years ago. And then stuff happened and I put everything aside and now I'm finishing up my studies with him. And uh, really, I feel uh, a great resonance with evolutionary astrology in general. Um, and it put everything together for me, as I'm sure it has for a, a lot of you. And um, so I guess let's begin. So, um, and bear with me, I'm new at this whole process. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to first talk about the first layer of Venus and Scorpio um, and what I call the agony and ecstasy of intimacy. Um, because this deep merging of Scorpio and Venus is both um, enchanting and, and really intriguing, but also quite scary as it takes us into depths that are um, quite, um, quite scary initially, but um, into places where merging causes us to sacrifice part of ourselves, perhaps. And, um, and again, this is especially for natives of Venus and Scorpio, but I think as we're all experiencing this collectively, um, there's some resonance here for the collective as well. Um, so Venus and Scorpio themes, you know, deepening intimacy, um, deepening need for uh, sexuality and, you know, taking risks to merge and invest with another. Um, and in the taking of that risk, um, we have to handle possibly rejection or um, abandonment. And how we handle that is a huge, huge deal with Venus and Scorpio. Um, and there's, you know, the risk of feeling unloved. And what does that mean? Um, and it takes us back really about uh, to our relationship to ourselves and how we feel about ourselves. Because as we all know, our relationships are a mirror um, for something inside of us. And then we go through rejection or abandonment, something inside of us has done that at the same time. It's hard to see it that way, but that's ultimately what it's about. And of course, you know, relationship, um, you know, is a spiritual path and it's, Ultimately, it's about our connection to the source, God, goddess, and, you know, how healthy is that? So when we go through these trials and tribulations with Venus and Scorpio, we're really um, going through uh, a difficulty in our spiritual path at the same time. It's all quite connected, especially in Scorpio. And the thing with, with Venus, you know, it's, you know, because it rules Libra, it's, it's more, um, you know, on the surface of things. So going into Scorpio is quite, uh, is quite a challenge, really, for Venus in this position. So let's go on to the next layer of this journey, which is Venus retrograde. And... Basically, um, you know, during Venus rest retrograde, we're going to be, you know, reviewing any unfinished business with, you know, love, money, what was missed, what needs clearing. And um, I'm going to move this over a little bit here so I can read. Um, uh, we may, 
you know, there are issues that come up that, that we need to work through. Um, and sometimes we also encounter uh, new people in this process, you know, and they feel familiar. They may be people from earlier part of this life or a past life. And so, and that may be compelling, especially because it's Scorpio. Um, I mean, any Venus retrograde pattern will bring that theme of reconnecting with someone from our past. But in Scorpio, it may feel a little more uncomfortable because there may be I mean, the unfinished business may have to do around, you know, sexuality or, or maybe a past merging that didn't quite disconnect in a healthy manner. And or we will get triggered very easily, perhaps, with a, with a Venus retrograde. Um, and what's interesting is that this 40-day retrograde cycle, it's so interesting because it, it also ties in with uh, that biblical theme, the 40 days and nights of, of, of retreat, of going within and finding our center again. And um, I find this especially applicable because of Venus's close proximity to the sun. And it's like relationship as it applies to our identity and uh, our essential self. Um, and, and how it actually helps us reconnect with our essential self. So it's, I find that really interesting. Um, so Venus circles the Earth 13.004 uh, times in eight years, creating this five-point star um, of stations, uh, which is a pentagram, and it shifts back a few degrees every time. So a lot of times we'll see the uh, same thing theme repeating on these same cycles and um, and it's always interesting to look back to see if you're revisiting a, a theme yet again and maybe um, understanding it in a new way um, each time you know a different a different facet of the same theme and of course these uh, Venus retrograde occurs every 18 months, uh, but in one sign in particular, once every eight years. So the last time Venus was retrograde in Scorpio was uh, in 2010. And we can take a look at that here. Um, so yeah, so I, I created a list here of you know the different times and it was interesting for me actually looking at this um, as um, back in 2010, I lost uh, a cat who I'd had for 20 years, and he was like my soulmate. And it was a really big deal because it, it was a very important being in my life. And then in 2002, I realized, oh, yes, I moved in with that person. We joined households and children. And in 1994, my uh, husband and I had purchased a home and I was feeling great regret over the huge financial um, investment that was involved there so um, so you can go through it's really interesting to see you know you know what happened in, in each of these time periods and it's also interesting now we've moved in as of this time it's incorporating Libra into the retrograde cycle so it's not just about um, you know shared resources you know um, and sexuality now we're dealing with you know one-on-one -on -one relationship dynamics and you know revisiting what it means to be in relationship and to connect with somebody and to communicate with somebody um, and you know so it's incorporating that that bridge between Scorpio and Libra this time around so um, this is what I call the autumn sojourn, part one, procession down the aisle. Um, so um, the day before Venus enters Scorpio on, you know, um, on September 8th, uh, she'll be at 29 Libra, uh, squaring Mars at 29 Capricorn. And to me, uh, it's kind of a message of, of strength and resolve. Um, you know, Venus is getting ready for this, this really intense journey into Scorpio, which is like Mars territory, and there's Mars and Capricorn, you know, uh, you know, saying get your gets things in order, you know, have a strategy, you know. Uh, there's a little bit of tension. I mean, they were in opposition 
um, this past the last month, um, you know, uh, from Leo and Aquarius. So there's a, a little bit of tension between, uh, you know, the masculine and the feminine generally when there's a square, um, you know, something's shifting, especially with 29 degrees, there's always like some sort of ending going on. Um, so that occurs on September 8th. Venus enters Scorpio on the 9th. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, what I feel might be trepidation. You know, are we really doing this? This is, this is big, you know, but I'm going to do it. And uh, then a few days later, uh, Venus at 2 Scorpio opposes Uranus. And um, it's sort of like this first passage, you know, it's a three-part passage, um, you know, and this is the first one. It's sort of like an introduction to what, what might be coming, you know, and Uranus is an awakening moment um, that feels a little uneasy for Venus, but she takes note of that. Um, maybe there's a new person, some, or maybe she, yeah, maybe she meets somebody who's completely different from um, whom she is previously associated with, or, or a new idea enters her head. Um, so there's this kind of inspiration maybe to transform something in her um, modus operandi or uh, maybe she wants to escape you know it depends on how we handle Uranus you know there's you know a higher and a lower manifestation of how we deal with these energies and you know for some people it's it's too scary and they just want to run away so that that's always a possibility with Uranus um, but as we go on a few days later, Venus at six Scorpio um, squares Lilith at six Aquarius. Um, and, you know, Lilith is about being authentic, you know, and accessing your authentic truth, you know, be empowered now, be, embody your desires, uh, Lilith says to Venus and Scorpio. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's time to you know it's time to get real about what's happening and then uh she you know she keeps going through scorpio through the end of september and then uh then uh, october 5th she stations uh and she's still for a few days stationary retrograde at 10 scorpio um and it's almost like okay we need to revisit relationship intentions or or emerging intentions or you know financial um intentions you know anything involved uh in, in the scorpionic realm so what's interesting to note here is that uranus is in a venus ruled sign taurus venus is in a mars ruled sign scorpio and mars and lilith are in a uranus ruled sign so this really adds quite a deeper dimension to this, you know, tango, you know, they're all in each other's signs and they're, and they're all, you know, fixed signs, which are immensely powerful, immensely creative. So the potential for creating something new and for um, getting deeper into dynamics of, um, you know, what it means to be human, to be alive, to, to be with others and to create, to co-create with others. This is a big theme right now. So let me get my, here we go. All right, so part two, and what I call swimming in the deep end. Um, and this is the retrograde part of her cycle. So there's a descent uh, into the abyss of intense longing. And um, which is Venus retrograde in Scorpio and uh, really feeling what she really wants, really accessing her deepest desires. And to me, it's a hero's journey because in this journey, she faces life and death and they're interwoven because she realizes in order to embrace something new, she has to let go of the past and she can't embrace something new until the past has been released. You know, it's like you have to jump off a cliff 
to get to the other one. You can't hang on to one thing and still get something new. And that's the scary part because there's a huge unknown about the new. Um, but she's, she's doing it. There's, there's, she's gathering all the resources here. Um, there's, there's magic possible. It's about keeping the faith in this journey. Um, so then she has another visit with Mars in this process. Um, and Mars actually accompanies her, uh, actually contacts her when she's quite still. You know, she hasn't quite started moving yet, you know, at 10 Aquarius on October 10th. So there's like another test of uh, authenticity here, you know, crisis of awareness, staying true to her vision, um, uh, advocating for what you truly passionately believe. And uh, so I see it, you know, even though it's a, it's a square and uh, perhaps it will come in the form of a person or an idea or a situation it will force her to, uh, you know, polarize her ideas and uh, deepen herself into them. And it was interesting because I had called this swimming in the deep end. And then just a couple of days ago, I noticed the Sabian symbol, symbol for 11 degrees Scorpio, uh, a drowning man rescued. This is a symbol of the soul's personal immortality and of its unabated eagerness in returning to the various phases of its experience again and again. There is here a consistent partnership between man and nature so that the very accidents of circumstance can be counted on to serve him as long as he maintains his underlying enthusiasm of being. His consciousness has a continuity through his sense of responsibility for his own creative powers. The key word is safety. So to me, this is quite an enlightening symbol um, and sort of an empowering one. You know, she is swimming in the deep end, but she will make it. And she might, she might encounter some difficulty, but it looks positive for Venus here. So um, moving right along here. Um, so the retrograde begins, and there's another conference with Lilith at 8 Scorpio, 8 Aquarius, on October 17th, and uh, a message of deeper embodiment of the empowered feminine as she moves along her path. And what's really interesting I discovered about Lilith recently is that you know that's a nine-month cycle. You know she spends about nine months in each sign. So, and of course, she is quite connected with the moon, of course. You know, the moon to me is um, about the gestational process, you know, and, you know, creating new life. And I see Lilith as the birthing process and what has to happen when you give birth, which is really um, about letting go and allowing the energy through you, and you can't fake it. It's, it's about um, being in the present completely and authentic. So Lilith it will give Venus uh, probably, in the, and again, whatever form she comes in, it's either in the form of a person or a situation. And then after that, we have the second Venus-Uranus opposition. Uh, at uh, zero Scorpio, 15 minutes, zero Taurus, 15 minutes on October 31st, Halloween. So um, kind of interesting timing here as well. Um, and this is the big one. It's always the retrograde one, of course, uh, as we know, is always, you know, the the really powerful intense uh, of the three oppositions in, in a three act play like this. So it's, uh, it's like perhaps uh, we feel at this point, there is another way we can incorporate Uranus more deeply um, and incorporate innovation, maybe in a more of an eclectic arrangement in our situation or relationship or whatever. Um, Uranus wants, you know, uh, 
fully embodied individuality, I feel, you know, it's about being, you know, it's rising to a new level here of, uh, of improvement. And in relation to Venus, it's like we're going to elevate relationships somehow. It's going to be different for sure. You know, we don't go through a Venus Uranus opposition like this uh, without some sort of change happening. And we're moving generally as a collective, I believe, uh, into um, to, uh, the, the idea of relationship being two empowered individuals joining forces um, and creating something new. Uh, so it's more of an interdependence, the, the power of interdependence. Whereas, um, you know, if, when we're not embracing that Uranian dynamic and relationship, we're just doing it because we feel needy and we don't feel we can handle life by ourselves, then we're moving, it's more of a codependent dynamic. So I think we're going to be definitely challenged with uh, visiting those themes within ourselves during this time. And again, I had to uh, look up the Sabian symbol, which was quite interesting. Um, given that Uranus has to do one of the things that rules is friends and friendship. So the Sabian symbol for one degree Scorpio, a sightseeing bus. This is a symbol of the individual spirit in its catholicity or universality and of the naivety and indomitability of its interest in life as a whole. Here man is free from all artificial boundaries of experience and is encouraged to reach out widely and profitably in sharing his realization with his fellows. There is an exceptional range of understanding and sympathy and a gift for developing varying avenues of self-expression. The key word is friendliness. So I thought that was quite interesting, you know, um, that that's the key word for one degree Scorpio, where Venus is in opposition to Uranus, um, which is connected with friends. So now uh, this leads us to resolving conflict. And so perhaps some of the issues that have arisen with the Scorpio uh, Taurus situation is, you know, issues of, of sex or money or anything that people merge together about. Um, and the fact that Venus is moving back into Libra uh, at this point and Uranus retreating back into Aries, it's, it's almost as if, okay, we're arguing about all this stuff. We're, we're not coming to an agreement. Maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and assess why are we together? What are we, what are we really arguing about? What can we, can we start communicating in a more civil manner? And so we're back into Libra and learning about communication and balance. Um, which is interesting because that's where the third and final opposition on November 30th occurs. It's the 29th degree of Libra and 29th degree of your, uh, Aries. So w it's like we're, we have to go back to the drawing board and, uh, and, and, and figure things out and, and have this, get a clean slate basically. And also it's interesting because, you know, the 29th degree is the final degree. So there's, you know, perhaps, you know, we have to end some old contracts and begin new ones. Um, so that there's a flavor of that here as well. So um, I see this as, you know, learning enlightened communication um, as well. So uh, years ago uh, when my kids were little, I remember taking this step parenting class when we talked about I messages you know, the importance of communicating what we feel and stating instead of getting into you did this or you made me feel that and getting into the blame and shame game where people end up posturing and defensiveness and, you know, just strange games, passive aggressiveness. Um, with Uranus here, you know, it's about enlightened communication, enlightened uh, relations. So, this is the time period we, we can refine how we communicate and how we balance our individual selves and, our, uh, and ourselves within relationship. Because as we know, in any relationship, 
it's two individuals and it's the relationship. So there's three entities that we're balancing essentially. Um, also with Uranus involved, um, perhaps this is about allowing radical self-expression within relationship. Um, how can we strengthen ourselves individually um, and again, as I mentioned previously, you know, diminishing individuality opens the door to codependency. And interdependency is the sharing of evolved individuals and builds true stability. So these are all themes up for, up for reviewing. Uh, interestingly, at this time as well, at the same day that Uranus enters Aries, the lunar nodal axis moves into Cancer Capricorn. And um, so um, we're seeing a, 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 an involvement, a collective involvement here with our, all of our paradigms around, um, our social paradigms and our paradigms around nurturing and about, and structure, you know, what supports at the, uh, the relationship at, at the social level. So, and Venus already in Libra is creating a grand cardinal cross with Uranus and the lunar nodal axis. Um, so it's like Venus and Uranus are this collective skip step that needs to be incorporated into the paradigm. Uh, Cancer North Node implores that we nurture this new paradigm. Capricorn South Node uh, being the paradigm of a structure needing a remodel, you know, one that incorporates a sense of safety and connection. Cancer, as we usher in the unfamiliar. Um, the family social structure versus personal freedom of thought and uh, new relationship paradigms. Perhaps, you know, it might involve spending time apart, um, dad taking care of the kids, mom working, uh, becoming less insular, more involvement with community. Um, and I feel that's a, it's a, it's a theme because, you know, in our busy lives, we forget to connect with, you know, the village, you know, the community around us and how important, you know, we always say it takes a village to raise a child, but, you know, it takes a village to support a partnership as well. And I think there's an importance of, you know, including others. Uh, and they, they actually, um, I'm going to get to that on another slide here the importance of connecting with other people, you know, other couples, you know, to sustain a relationship. And I also think, you know, if, you know, in the case of like divorce, when there are children, um, these, the communication style, it's a huge, huge deal. You know, a lot of people going through divorce um, end up using the children to communicate with the other person, which is really dysfunctional. Um, and it hurts the children. So this is all part of, you know, a possible outcome of this whole grand cross here is, you know, honoring the other parent and doing it in a holistic way, you know, you know and communicating um, with the other person as an important uh, co-parenting arrangement and how to do that in a very civilized and also honoring uh, way that honors the kids. So there's a lot of tension and rebalancing of all these social paradigms here. So I'm gonna include a few sample charts of uh, Venusian Uranian relationships, which I, I find kind of interesting in lieu of, uh, you know, things that these particular celebrity, mostly celebrity couples here, as that's the easiest thing to, uh, to reference. I'm not gonna go into depth uh, regarding their relationship dynamics, but wanted to cover this a little bit. Um, so this is the charts of, uh, Roger Smith, uh, in the inner wheel and Anne Margaret on the outer wheel. Um, they, their marriage lasted 50 years, um, through alcoholism, severe injury. Anne Margaret fell off a stage and was very severely injured. And Roger Smith had a chronic illness early on and which forced him to leave acting and he ended up uh, managing Anne Margaret's career. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, uh, her Uranus opposes his Venus and also her Uranus is in his seventh house along with a lot of other planets of hers. So, um, so let's see what they said about their relationship on the next slide here. Oops. 
Um, so, uh, and Margaret said, I like the guy and we still laugh together because we really like each other. We laugh at ourselves. We get into weird situations. If you can't laugh at yourself, you're in trouble. You know, this is very Venus Uranus. Uh, it's very simple. Actually, we both want it to work. And he said, it's corny, but true by doing what she wanted. I liked myself much better. Being with her was more important than all my childhood dreams about being a famous actor. So anyway, it's kind of an interesting when you, you know, you read about what people say about the relationships and you look at their charts. And of course, um, you know, these are celebrities and, you know, uh, so, but it, it, they're always the easiest ones to study because they're all right out there. Uh, but I'm going to actually get to the next slide here. So the next one uh, is uh, Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman. And um, I'm going to see if I can move this thing on the right up a little bit here. Okay. Um, so another marriage lasted 50 years, uh, survived the overdose of Paul's son from his first marriage and Paul's functional alcoholism, and as well as just the celebrity thing. Um, you know, Paul was always being, you know, hounded by a lot of women and, um, and it was uh, apparently, uh, you know, a challenge for his children, you know, the, the celebrity. But we see here, they have a Uranus-Venus connection both ways. Um, his Uranus on her Venus, her Uranus square his Venus. And uh, so they were also um, apparently um, quite good friends with each other even before their marriage. So let's take a look at what they say. Uh, Paul and I were good friends before we were lovers. We really liked each other. We could talk to each other. We could tell each other anything without fear of ridicule or rejection. There was trust. Um, sexiness wears thin after a while and beauty fades. But to be married to a man who makes you laugh every day, ah, now that's a real treat. That was Joanne Woodward, obviously. Uh, and likewise, Newman chimed in, adding they owed success to some combination of lust and respect and patience and determination. Uh, people who were close to them said there was always a tangible chemistry between them and they constantly touched each other when in public, suggesting that the physical attraction never died. So, um, so another, you know, they somehow incorporated the higher side of Uranus. Uh, you know, not many of these Hollywood marriages last long. So it's always really interesting when they do. Um, and I, here's a chart of George Takai uh, and Brad Altman, and um, they've been together for 31 years. Uh, they did marry in 2008 when gay marriage became legal in California, and they've been politically active in gay rights issues. And there again is another mutual, uh, you know, Uranus-Venus connection both ways. Um, Venus sextile Uranus on one side, Venus square Uranus on the other. And um, I don't have any quotes uh, for them. They, I've, I found a lot of things talking about, you know, the, their work in, in gay rights and, you know, being a gay relationship. Um, but I just thought it was really interesting. You know, they did incorporate, you know, I mean, it's, I, you know, the difficulty of, you know, being gay in a culture that didn't, wasn't supportive of it and staying together is quite, quite something and quite indicative of this, uh, you know, Venus Uranus connection. And then, okay, so this was interesting. These are fictional characters from uh, the TV show Friends. Uh, they actually have birth dates, which is interesting. Um, so, uh, and, and it, Chandler Bing and Monica Geller from Friends, they actually have these birth dates. And uh, there was an episode, well, actually they were friends for many years and then suddenly got into a relationship. And um, there was an episode when the other character, Joey, he yearns for a relationship like Monica and Chandler's, and they, Monica and Chandler suggest that the fact that they were friends first could have contributed to their closeness. And there's uh, Uranus Venus connection. Of course, uh, you know, Chandler has it, uh, Venus Uranus, and of course, then Monica's is quite closely, Uranus is quite closely opposite the Venus. So that was just interesting kind of thing, just from the curios curiosity point here. All right. Um, and I did discover there's been some research on a recent study of thousands of couples on marriage and happiness 
John Hellowell, a University of British Columbia economist and the co-author of the UN World Happiness Report, found evidence suggesting that the most important factor for a lasting happy relationship was whether or not you see your romantic partner as your closest friend. Uh, Hellowell and his research team looked at data from two large British surveys and the Gallup World Poll. After accounting for couples' age, gender, income, and health conditions, they found that couples who were best friends and lived together were just as happy as couples who were best friends and married. So basically, it uh, doesn't matter married or not, um, if your significant other, it, you, you see them as your best friend, that is like the, bit, the best foundation for a good relationship. Um, so here's some of my reflections. You know, um, traditional astrology mentions aspects between these bodies as indicative of an exciting but short-lived relationship, which is, yes, possible, but not always the case. I just don't think it's been, uh, you know, supported, you know, the higher side of this connection has been so supported in our culture. Um, our culture seems to go gravitate towards Venus Neptune type of relationships, which encourages illusion, uh, reflects the societal obsession with high expectations, which results in disillusionment. Whereas Venus Uranus encourages us to upgrade our ideas of relationship, including friendship, as the main ingredient for deep and lasting romantic relationships, um, thereby shifting and improving the paradigm in the collective. Uh, Venus's proximity and recurring dance with the sun. Uh, represents our longing for union, and it's the spiritual path that leads us back to ourselves as divine beings. Um, and that's the that's part of that Venus Sun dance I was mentioning earlier. Also, it's important to note that the length of a relationship is not a reflection of its success or value, uh, as many long relationships are inherently dysfunctional as well. However, the ability to stay together through the inevitable crises, ill health, financial losses that occur over a long period shows a mutual respect and a grinding down of the ego, which is a natural result of devotion on the spiritual path of which a committed relationship can serve as a vehicle in many circumstances. Um, so let me see if I can wind up here. So anyway, that's my total presentation. Uh, so I know I'm ending a little bit earlier. <laughs> so I'm open to, um, let me get back to the big view here. Any questions um, or any comments? I am totally open and would be happy to chat with anybody. Um, Yes, thank you so much, Catherine. That was fantastic. So much detail. Thank you. Um, Carolyn does have a question. Um, okay. I'd like to put her chart up on the screen if that's okay with you. Oh, absolutely. Sure. If you could stop share, I'll be back with her chart in just a moment. Okay. Carolyn, Carolyn go ahead. Hi, Catherine. Hello. How are you? You sound Good. great. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I can't look at myself. I'm all red. <laughs> um, it was a while ago on, on My Soul, Mate Bachu, who passed. Anyway, what I wanted to ask about Venus is that um, I've been going through a bit of a period of being a hermit um, since February 2015 when I retired. Mm -hmm. And I understand why, and it's fine. Um, it's been a real growing experience, and I've mm. learned a lot through not looking at others to see who I am. Mm. So that is what I am talking about. That is what I'm asking you about. So Venus is now in my sixth house, I'm a Libra and I will, it will be going in and it will be going back and forth across my south node and my Mercury. And it will also, it'll be like Uranus is going back and forth across my 28 Aries ascendant. Right. So I was wondering what you would have to say really in general about Venus, Venus and her effect 
on the interior person. Like I'm not really dealing with a lot of people except online, which has been just EA Zoom meetings have been such a gift. Thank you, Linda, sure. as always, and the team. But really my outside life and meeting people is not, I don't see a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I would imagine with Venus going retrograde in Scorpio through your seventh house, perhaps um, clearing some things that, about your relationship still. Um, and I don't know what came to me is possibly um, connecting with your partner who passed at some level. You, there could be a connection that you start receiving messages from him or a process and completely, you know, um, a feeling of, you know, if there was any unfinished business there to work through. And maybe that's why um, you have been a hermit because you feel like you need to, to still process some things from that. And I think Uranus crossing your ascendant, um, it, I think it, you're opening up yourself to some, some new way of being in this world. Um, and it's interesting also because, you know, the nodes currently this summer are intercrossing your natal nodes. You know, we had this, you know, eclipse at, you know, Leo Aquarius, you know, so I'm sure you must have been feeling some of that as well. Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, if that, any of that resonates with you. I went the wrong way. Um, <laughs> what I'm feeling a lot is relief. Mm -hmm. Getting to know who I really am. And I've been learning how to trust myself. Good. And not always look outside to confirmation. Um. Yeah. My happiest, I haven't spoken about him much, but some of my happiest days ever appears. I can't talk about it now. We're yeah. on my horse's back. Yeah. Or yeah, sitting beside him in the pasture and having him wuffle my hair. It was just, it was perfect. Wow. Absolutely perfect. Mm. So um, that was that was my best relationships have been with animals. Ah. Mm-hmm. Well so, that's the unconditional love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I I I understand. I I do get that I chose my chart including the balsamic moon that says you chose to finish up things in this life and it's not always going to be pleasant. Um, so I was just yeah. wondering, you know, what you're saying about, yeah, coming to new realizations. I've been told by others that I need to come out. My Pluto polarity point is 10th Aquarius and it's out. And I don't know if you deal with um, mystic rectangles, but I have one whose um, corner is just a, was on my natal, well, part of it is my natal vir Virgo. And that speaks to how I might come out of the shadows because with Neptune conjuncting my sun, I've been one to hide who I really am. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I can't, I can't imagine. I hear that it's all going to be new. I hear new relations and I 
I can't imagine, and I'm not, I'm not upset. Yeah. Well, you know, I think with Neptune conjunct the sun, it's about being a channel in a sense, you know, it's like your sun really shines when you keep that channel, that divine channel open. Um, and that's the vehicle for your sun to shine. And with North Node in the first house, you know, in a sense, you know, I know that the, the death of a loved one, a partner is really devastating, but you will, you're going, part of your nodal, your axis, and you know, the south node in the seventh, north node in the first, is about coming into your own and, and getting empowered through, you know, personal action and, and, and taking, taking steps, taking risks, you know, and, and taking measured risks, you know, it's not something you have to like just jump out and do everything that's uncomfortable, but it's really important to take those steps for sure. So I hope that's helpful for you. It is. Thank you very much, Catherine. You're, oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Catherine, we have a question from Diana. Okay. Go ahead, Diana. Unmute. There you go. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Hi, I'm interested in your perspective. My Pluto is right at 11 degrees Scorpio where Venus will be retrograding. Mm -hmm. I really connected to the uh, Sabian symbol of, that you provided on that degree, mm. specifically the part of returning to the various phases of its experience again and again, serving the person as a source of creative power. I very much relate to this. I, I feel it makes me very reflective, introspective in this regard. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I was just um, hoping to hear your perspective on Venus right on my Pluto, which is also retrograde in Scorpio. Right, right. Uh, you know, Pluto on the 12th, it, you know, it's, it's a tough one because your life goes through upheavals and you have no control. <laughs> and it's like it's always being a test of your of your ability to withstand the changes you know and um and i'm sure with with sun and taurus uh, opposing you know keeping that stability and keeping your feet on the ground through the changes i'm sure it's, it can be difficult at times but you know what you know as nietzsche and as nietzsche had said what doesn't kill me makes me stronger you know um but venus going over that you know you might feel um you know, I mean, obviously, any Venus-Pluto connection, you know, there's always a possibility of a, a new love interest and being, compul you know, you know, really, really uh, sort of like a compulsive love interest that might be overwhelming and uh, take you really uh, down a deep path. And it's important, you know, to, of course, Anna, being a Taurus, you know, keep your, keep your grounding through anything like that, or developing just a, or developing maybe not for a person, but for for some path uh, in your life that you're following, or, or maybe continuing some passion you're currently uh, involved in now, but going at a deeper level with it. Um, so, being a Scorpio rising, you know, you you're no stranger to the intensity, I'm sure, but. Um, that's always a possibility with Venus. Yeah, Venus stationing uh, right opposite your sun, Jupiter, right on Pluto. Um, you know, and, you know, in the 12th house, you might, it might feel like it's a little overwhelming. Um, and, you know, take deep breaths and, you know, and, and not rushing into anything is, is an important piece there as well. It's so. interesting. I am in a committed relationship. But uh, it's interesting because the 12th house I never really related to. I see it more as Pluto in the, in the first house or Pluto right on the ascendant. I don't know if my chart is off by seconds or minutes or what. But uh. I never quite related to the Pluto in the 12th. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. But anyways, thank you so much for sharing sure. your perspective. I oh, sure. Thank you. We're welcome. Great. Thank you, Diana. Any other questions or comments? I had a uh, general uh, question. Would this um, 
for someone who has Venus in Aquarius, would this um, kind of heighten that um, energy since it is a, a Venus Uranus connection? I would think so. Um, because I, I, I definitely think so because, you know, Venus and Aquarius ruled by Uranus and Uranus is currently opposing Venus and Scorpio. Um, so I think all the fixed signs are quite activated right now. Generally, um, there's just been so much activity going on. Um, so yeah, I, the answer is, I think so. And as, of course, Venus and Aquarius, um, and it's interesting because, you know, Aquarius, you know, the, the idea is that, it's, you know, it's very detached. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, you know, Venus and Scorpio is about deep enmeshment and Aquarius is wanting to keep a cool head. So it can feel, and that tension between the two can feel uncomfortable, you know, um, and it's interesting too because Uranus is in Taurus, and it's which is a square aspect to Aquarius also. So it's like, how does how do we merge our ideals with reality? How do we start embodying the things that we've been espousing? And um, so we're all being asked to walk or talk, <laughs> definitely in many different ways, especially you know in the relationship realm, especially. Great. Thank you, Wanda. And thank you, Catherine. I have a quick question before we wind down. Okay. Um, during the last retrograde, Venus was um, at four degrees Aries. That was the Venus star point. And um, during that time, I had an issue with money with, with, some friend, with a friend. And mm -hmm. um, so now we, we have Venus in Scorpio and Libra. Now, if that money issue comes up again... What would you advise generally with money issues? Um, I, I think, well, it's hard without looking at an actual chart, for, uh, especially, but um, so the last one that you experienced was in Aries and you had yes. an issue come up with a friend and was it resolved or is it still an ongoing issue? No, I think it was, it, it was over at that time. It, I think it resolved, although it's kind of still in my memory. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm, I know I wouldn't do the same thing again. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering, in terms of money, I guess, any, any special advice? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think it needs to be in alignment with what your goals are, your ultimate goals are. Um, uh, it can't be anything for, I think, you know, a, a quick buck. <laughs> um, I think with Uranus involved here, it's, if you invest in something, it has to serve what you feel is the highest good. Um, and what serves your long-term vision. Um, so that's my general take on that. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Very good. Sure. Sure. Um, and someone in the chat is asking, as someone who will have the Venus retrograde Uranus opposition on her vertex, could you possibly teach me something about my natal... Venus Uranus conjunction in Scorpio. <laughs> <A bit complicated. laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I would think that relationship has to again incorporate something that's out of the out of the ordinary and you know being in a in a normal um what we consider a normal merging of two people together um isn't going to work for you you have you are drawn to people who are going to teach you something or people that elevate you in some way um and anything less just isn't going to work. <laughs> that's my, 
my feeling. Um, so it's a tall order, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Venus Uranus is is wanting wanting to elevate the standard and um, wanting to learn. You know, wants to learn more about what a deep relationship is about and what that means, and willing and is willing to take that risk. So it's uh, it's it's quite a, a exciting journey, I would say. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, thank you, Gori, and thank you, Catherine. That brings us to the end of your meeting. Thank you so much for those wonderful answers and advices. Would you all thank please you. thank Catherine Zumstein. See you next time, Catherine. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, <laughs> thank you.